Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is May 24th, 2019, and we are recording this interview uh, in, uh, in a home in Davis, California, in Yolo County. Uh, we, <laughs> today, we are interviewing a really cool, amazing, ordinary but extraordinary family. Um, today we are interviewing, uh, Scott and Joanna Purvis. Is that how you pronounce it? Purvis. Purvis. Yep. Like nervous. Like nervous Purvis. Which we are. Like never nervous. <laughs> and we're kind of breaking new ground because we are also interviewing three of the four Purvis children from left to the right, Maddie, Sophie, and Jake. Uh, for those of you who will remember, we kind of... You know, historically on Mormon Stories, we have tried to interview families. So whether it's uh, Clay Christensen and his brother-in-law, Matt Elgren, or, uh, you know, the, the Hackings, Paul and Lisa Hacking and their son, Kyle, uh, you know, Jerry Johnson and, and his wife, Julie, with Doug and Laurie Chekets. Uh, you know, we some of our most impactful Mormon Stories episodes historically have been families. And uh, in addition to, you know, Kyle Hacking coming on a few years ago, we were so blessed this year to have Cody and Leah Young bring on their daughter, Brinley, who is 15, and to talk about uh, their, their family's Mormon story, their family's Mormon journey. And uh, that's what today is going to be. It's going to be another one of those epic, multi-hour dive deep into the story of a uh, a Mormon family. And uh, today's Mormon family is fascinating on a lot of levels, but just to give you a preview, uh, uh, it's, it's a California story. It's a story, it's a multi-generational Mormon family that, that kind of uh, grew up and was raised here in, in California. Ultimately, Scott became uh, a bishop of his ward here in Davis slash Sacramento area. I'm sure we're gonna find out that Joanna had her own slate of callings. Um, and, and there are some fun twists along the way, uh, uh, regarding other members of the family. So it's going to be one of those epic stories. And so it's going to not only cover a family's Mormon journey, but also, um, how, you know, how can, uh, a, a Mormon Bishop end up losing his faith? What happens with his family when that happens? And, uh, we're going to be talking uh, there are going to be some LGBT themes as well, because what a Mormon faith crisis these days doesn't include an LGBT <laughs> slant, right? Hmm. Um, and so we're going to be covering all that today. And uh, we know that you guys can't get enough of these family faith transition stories. So without any further ado, uh, Scott and Joanna, welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thank you. Thanks. We have to just one thing. Our our daughter Lily couldn't be here. Yeah, shout and, out to Lily. And oh. she she came home from Santa Cruz yesterday, and she had a fever and had to work tonight. Anyway, long story. She just left about an hour ago. So shout out to Lily. We love you, Lily. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, yeah, and of course, uh, Maddie, Sophie, and Jake. We're we're super happy to have you guys along and to get kind of a teen slash young adult perspective yeah thank you for having us totally yeah thanks <laughs> <laughs> we're, it's going to be a little awkward as they pass the mic back and forth but uh we've been practicing we're here we're here with a three camera shot with three microphones and just me <laughs> so uh we're trying to do a lot all in once yeah. all right so let's begin as we always do give us a little bit just a brief kind of glimpse into kind of the Mormon ancestry for both you guys. All right, I have the mic, so I guess I'll go first. Okay. Mostly, though, because she told me to. Um, so I grew up in Davis, California, which is just a little bit west of Sacramento, and uh, was born and raised here, and then I really was only gone for a mission, college, and then right back home after we got married. I grew up in a family that was... Uh, kind of like a convert family because my mother came from she always called herself a, an army brat and her her dad was in the military and so they moved around a lot but when he was gone they they re retreated to Brigham City so she always called Brigham City home and when she was there with her mom and family they were all very Mormon 
Um, my her mother was a member but not really active my grandpa got baptized but really didn't ever have anything to do with the church he was a, a world war ii vet who i'm very proud of um in fact i have to just say this guy i always have to tell the story my mother's maiden name is death and her dad's name was richard and he he was the first sergeant of his battalion so he was sergeant dick death <laughs> which is the <laughs> coolest name ever, and it's true. It's not baloney, and and, uh, and he he was in the tanks, so he was Sergeant Death. And he, anyway, he was awesome. Um, so my mom and dad uh, got married. She her family ended up in Salinas, California, where there's an army base. My dad was raised in Hollister, which is not far. So they actually knew each other a little bit, but they they met in uh, at Chico State. They were Chico State Wildcats. They fell in love, got married there. But my dad wasn't a member of the church. He joined the church about the time I was born, 72. They went to the temple a few years later. Um, I'm one of five. My older brother and I went to the temple with my parents. I don't have a memory of it. I was like two, I think. My which, bro- which temple? Uh, Oakland. Okay. Uh, my brother remembers the cafeteria. Uh, that's about it. He said it was great spaghetti. Pie. Yeah, right. I don't, I don't remember any of that. Um, and so my parents raised us in the church, and we were Mormons. Um, uh, but it, it was kind of like, I, I say a convert family because there wasn't like all these generations of active members. It was really, they were figuring it out on their, as a first generation member family, and we were the second. So we didn't play with our friends on Sunday, but, uh, and we'd have family home evening once in a long while. And, but man, we went to church and we went to seminary and we were going to go to BYU or Ricks. Those were our two options. And, um, but, but we didn't really talk about the scriptures. Um, we, and, and after church, you'd go out to lunch yeah. at a restaurant <laughs> on Sunday. Yeah. We would get in the car on the you way out. Problem the, with that, Joanna? <laughs> no, it's, it's just, it's just so foreign to how I was raised but anyway yeah we would we would be arguing about Chinese versus Mexican after church you know where to go for lunch I and love that I love it too it was great yeah. um, but we didn't know any difference so we we wouldn't swim on Sunday or play with friends but you know we'd go out to dinner because that was family I mean it was those kinds of things um, but there were these other families in the war that my my folks would always talk about like they were the real Mormons because they would they would go to Utah for general conference and, and um, they had a, they, you know, he was a dentist and had a boat. You know, they just fit this picture of what we all thought. That's what Mormons are. It <laughs> didn't really have anything to do with the restoration or anything. <laughs> um, my, my parents were believers, though. They were Mormons. And my dad had this really practical faith. He was raised a Christian, so he wasn't new to Christian faith. Just the, all the Mormon stuff was new for him when he joined the church. He was um, called as a bishop about the time I was leaving home. And so they, you know, they were always very active. Just, just kind of our, our little flavor of active, I guess. Missions were kind of expected, but not really, because my older brother was the first in our family to go. And so it was always talked about, but it wasn't like, well, you know, grandpa went, your dad went. We didn't, I didn't have any of that. Uh, my parents wanted us to do all that stuff. But I have these, just, I just had this ideal childhood. All, none of my friends were members of the church because we lived here, and there just weren't that many members. My mom was our den leader, and so all my buddies joined our Cub Scout den, and then a lot of them were in Boy Scouts with me all through the ward. Um, and that was all great. I mean, we, had a, we just had a really good childhood. My, we had a very happy family. I have an older brother, two younger brothers, and a sister, and they're all active to varying degrees. Um, I, have, I, have an, I have a brother who's an elders quorum president and an elder, another brother who teaches at BYU. Um, and then the other siblings are still active as well. So... My upbringing was pretty ideal. It was really, it was really pretty great. No complaints. <laughs> mom and dad were the best. Um, my mom passed about a year ago, and my dad passed last month. And so we've, we've had about a year and a half of some, some harder times. But I'm so sorry. Yeah. When you was th- that way too fast? No, that's good. <laughs> All right. No, that's good. When, uh, when, Tell us a little bit about uh, just your your spiritual life as a as a teen, you know, pre mission that kind of thing. Like, yeah, did you go to seminary? Did you was it Bruce R. McConkey kind of stuff? Was it? Did you do Moroni's Promise? Like, mm-hmm. what was your testimony like as a teen? So I remember as a freshman when I went to seminary, it was always early morning, all four years, and we'd have to ride our bikes, you know, to the church and then go to school from there. Um, 
I remember the teacher asked me to be the class president my, my freshman year, and I didn't know. That. What it ended up meaning was I called on people to say the prayer. Um, but I was, you know, so I was involved and stuff. I, I didn't, I was just not a really much of a student in junior high and high school. And I, I wasn't a bad kid. I wasn't, it wasn't that I was dumb. I just, just played and had a good time. I fit this nice middle thing. So I had an older brother that kept my folks busy with older, you know, first child stuff. And then three youngers who kept them all busy. And I sort of cruised in school, but also in church related stuff. Um, but the way my parents exercised their faith, and to answer this question a long way, when, when my dad taught us about the priesthood, it was about you have a duty to be there as a teacher to set up the sacrament and prepare it for the ward because everybody's depending on you. It, um, and uh, we're honest because that's what we do. When, when he taught me the law of chastity, um, in fact, right before I was getting ready to go on a mission, I had a girlfriend, and my dad said, if things get a little too hot and heavy, we'll go to the temple and then you'll have garments because the last thing you take off is the garments. Mm. But for him, that was his way of teaching me, you know, that. And, and by the way, if you get her pregnant, you're dropping out of school and pumping gas. That was his, he would tell me. And I didn't want to pump gas. I wanted to go to college. So kind so. of a practical, very practical Mormon upbringing. Yeah. And, it, and there was nothing there controversial or un-Mormon about it. It just was... It was really more his background of a practical Christian faith, and, and that's really how we were raised. And he was always that way. And so that's, I, I guess, I, we weren't really die hard as kids, but I think we thought we were. Sure. We, we just really weren't. So. And, and your, your testimony pre-mission got to what point? And it's okay to just say, I really didn't have one. Or I, I, it was just... I didn't, yeah, I really didn't have much of one. I think my parents' plan was to get us to Rick's or BYU, and then we'd figure that out and go on a mission. Okay. So you weren't like 16 years old praying Moroni's promise to try and know if it was true like me? No, but I, but I love Scripture Bowl. Cause it was fun, oh, right. you know, like, okay. it, and, um, <laughs> you know, I went to scout camp and, and youth conference at the Maritime Academy in the Bay area. It was just so much fun and the dances and stuff. Did you have to have dance cards? Like, like most people do in California, <laughs> you know, that went back and forth. I would go to the dances sometimes really just cause it was fun. I don't, I can't dance. So it wasn't that kind of thing, but sometimes there would be, sometimes there wouldn't be dance cards. It wasn't really, that's the thing that I didn't have growing up. I, I just learned from my friend, Mormon friends from California. That they were like little temple recommends where yeah. You, yeah. you couldn't get into the dance unless you had the dance card. Yeah. yeah. And you had to be worthy to have the dance card. Yeah, I remember getting turned away once because uh, one of the kids in our group didn't have one. So we drove all the way to Sacramento. <laughs> and my parents were so mad that they didn't let us in. And, you know, whatever. Anything else about being a, a California Mormon teenager that maybe people from Utah or other parts of the states would find interesting or not? You know, I. I so growing up as kind of a convert family, which, we, you know, I explained that, there was always this feeling that in Utah, they really did it. And like these other yeah. families that sort of hailed from Utah, they had a lot of Utah family. Um, and these couple of families in the ward that fit that, like, oh, well, they're actually, you know, they and they're all their family are from Provo. And it's, oh, they're those kind of Mormons. And, and it, not in a bad way. It was like, oh, they really know what they're doing. <laughs> and... Um, so it, it always felt like we were away from the core of the church a little bit. Yeah, it's so interesting. So I interviewed Spencer Nugent uh, just, just yesterday, who's from Jamaica. He, he and his family were the first Jamaican family baptized. Oh, wow. They felt the same thing. Really? It, it, yeah, and then they moved to Utah, and they realized how screwed up Utah is. <laughs> but all these, all these Mormon wards and stakes outside of Utah grow up thinking that like Utah is like Oz, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And if yeah. we could all, if only we could be at Oz, you know, we'd be doing the Mormon thing the right way. So right. everyone outside of Utah is growing up with this, you know, perfectionism, inadequate feelings of inadequacy. Oh, if we could only do it like the Utah right. Mormons. And sometimes the Utah Mormons are the most screwed up of all. Well, and so, <laughs> sorry. What? Oh, go ahead, well, Joanna. Go ahead, Joanna. Uh -oh. Pass it. Pass it. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to hear this. Redirect right away, but I have the opposite feeling. Like, all right, let's do your story. So let's jump to well, you. Well, no, you're not done with yours. We'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Utah Mormons were lame. I just thought, oh, that's the easy way to do it. That's you know. Okay, how so easy tell us about your upbringing, Joanna. <laughs> so, what's your maiden name? Rudd, R U D D. Okay. Um, so I grew up completely different than Scott. Like, 
almost complete polar opposites as far as being raised in the church, born in the covenant. Well, close. Anyway, my pioneer heritage, uh, Erastus Harper Rudd was in the um, Mormon Battalion. No, 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 no Zion's camp. Zion's camp. Yes. So um, I we're back to the very beginning of of Joseph Smith for my my you go family. Way back. Way back. Um, and my parents, I'm the second of seven children, so I was actually born in California and then uh, lived in southern Idaho until I was 13, very small, and then... Um, well, like... Like, uh, like Bear, Lake, Bear Lake County. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Like yeah. Liberty, yeah. Not, no, no post office, just outside of... in the county. Um, and... Loved it then, um, you know, drove a tractor, was very proud of that, was put a roof on with my dad, like just did 4-H and had my own heifer and, you know, nice. that, that kind of upbringing. <laughs> um, Something about the baling hay. Oh, yeah, well, the, yeah, driving tractor, baling hay, you know. I was very proud that I was stronger than my older sister. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was good with animals, but anyway. I don't know. I just, I was very competitive with sports. My dad was very athletic. And um, so we had that in common. Uh, he taught me how to shoot a basketball and how to play volleyball. And um, he played football, but I didn't. But running track, all of those things. But <clears throat> he was a student of the scriptures. And he, unlike Scott's dad, who would talk about don't get a girl pregnant because you're pumping gas. My dad would sit us down, down very formally and talk about Abraham and Isaac. And he was very Bruce Horaconkey. And we had, you know, Mormon doctrine out. And we would talk about Armageddon and the thousand years and the, the preexistence and the millennium. And, Second coming. Sons and, of the times, right? Yes. Jackson County, Missouri. And, <laughs> and like, I, I um, was very aware and learned from a very young age the, the nitty gritty of Mormonism. And loved it. So, so my growing up, so anyway, at 13, we moved to Grand Junction, Colorado. And so I did junior high and high school there. Yeah. Um, did you know any Fullers? No. Okay. Keep going. There were two stakes there. Okay. Anyway, three high schools, two stakes. Um, I loved the church. Absolutely loved. Um, had a strong testimony. Read the scriptures. Um went on trek and had a, a very significant spiritual personal experience. Um, just writing in my journal and being out looking in the mountains. And anyway, what was the spiritual experience? Like just feeling God's love. Like I, I just really tell our non Mormons what trek is. Oh, okay. So trek is, uh, the way that the Mormon church reenacts, uh, our pioneer heritage coming across the plains, being poor and having all of their possessions in a handcart and walking, you know, 1800 miles or however many miles it is to walk. So when youth in our church are 14 to 18, they can go on quote unquote trek and do a reenactment of what it would have been like to be a pioneer. So you wear pioneer clothes like the old aprons and the, you know, dresses to your dresses to your ankles and to your wrists and a bonnet and <laughs> anyway why are you guys all laughing at me I know it's just is... wait wait microphone oh yeah microphone. uh what, what, what were we saying maddie maddie oh, and just... lily are the only ones that went on trek here in utah what in were you california saying, oh i just was i was just gonna laugh at trek that was my whole thing it's just it's just funny but... did you guys do trek Lily and I did, and I forgot that you guys haven't, and that makes me a little bit bummed. I'm like, oh, you missed out on this crazy... So anyway. if you, you missed out on track, are you bummed? Not at all. It was the year that we left was Jake and I's time to go on track, and we're like, so... <laughs> yeah, that was 2016. Like we're not out, but like... Are we signing these forms? <laughs> yeah, so the time that we were planning for Trek and whatnot, I remember, because we were still in the church at the time. And we'll get there. We'll get to that. Point. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But you didn't have to go. You didn't have to they go. They didn't have to go. Yeah. And I, we were actually kind of sad about that because it is a uni unique experience. I was not sad about that. <laughs> for the record. All right, all right so you went to Trek. Yeah. I went to Trek. I loved it. But again, I'm a competitive person, and I love 
showing that women are strong physically and mentally, you know, that women can do things as well as the guys can. And, um, but spiritually they had us take a, a journal and go off by ourselves somewhere. And so behind Grand Junction is, uh, it's called the monument and it's Grand Junction is between the Rocky mountains and then like the desert of Utah. So it's like right on the border of Colorado and Utah. So you're leaving the pine trees and everything of, of Denver. And then you go across straight West for four hours. And that's Grand Junction before you hit the desert of Utah or the high desert. So the monument is this beautiful, uh, mountain range right in their backyard and it's red rock and it's beautiful. So I was up there with my journal and they just told us to take like an hour and, um, just write, think, think about God. And, and I just loved it. And I felt his love so much. I just, it wasn't Book of Mormon related. It wasn't, I wasn't specifically asking him that cause I already knew that was true <laughs> because if I would have been raised, I just never had doubts about any of the scriptures or any of the prophets or I just took them as fact black and white. So anyway, that was my, my trek. And then all of through my youth, I like was a, a leader for our girls camp and I would go and sing camp songs in front of the, the high council because they're like, Joanna, come and show the high council how great camp is. And um, I just helped promote steak dances and I had non-member friends come. I had two really close member friends, um, but like I didn't, I didn't ever drink. I was didn't have sex. I didn't, I was just very, I went to EFY. They used to have a program called Polish with Pleasure. What? Back in the day. <laughs> yes. It's, it's a. Wait, let's, let's just take it back there. I've never heard of this. <laughs> so her name was Vivian something. And she was like, looking back now, I think she looked like someone that would be on the Dallas TV show, like big hair. She was really pretty, but she taught us like, it was a co-ed camp at BYU and we're in the DT towers, but like we'd learn how to like ballroom dance and like how to like sit properly. And like, it's called polish with pleasure. <laughs> it's like, all, Interesting. It's like hold to the rod, right? Yeah. But, it, but it was like, polish with pleasure. but is it BYU campus and, and EFY? <laughs> I went to that and loved it. I, anyway, um, so high school for me was, we had seminary, um, and I just love sports and seminary and my family. It just. And you, you were talking about how we were talking about how like in Jamaica and in Sacramento, they were like, oh, the real Mormons are in Utah. Yeah. But you were oh. saying that you didn't. Oh, I, I just really thought that Utah Mormons just didn't have to earn it. I don't know how to explain it. Maybe it's my competitive nature. Like they didn't have to show their faith or live their faith or, you know what I mean? Like, Colorado and here raising my kids here and being a, an adult and sharing the gospel with my non-member friends that everyone I know you're constantly living your religion here or I guess living the culture I don't know but I just Utah Mormons I used to be like so bugged I'm like oh and you, we, don't, you don't even know and we call it the mission field right <laughs> yeah, the mission, yeah right? the mission field I'm like oh gosh <laughs> the, mission, the mission that, field is basically the everything field, outside of Utah the mission yeah. field right? is reality to me and I'm like people in Utah don't even know what reality is and they just think they're Mormons but they're really not Oh, geez. I know. We did it the right way, John. Um, uh, Very competitive. Yeah, she's a little competitive, everybody. Yeah, um, and, and the fallacy behind all that silly stuff is in Davis, California, we have UC Davis. And so I was raised with all these old timers in the ward. We had a world famous exotic animal veterinarian who the Sacramento Zoo named buildings after, named Murray Fowler. Sweetest man in the whole world was my scout leader. He would take us over to UC Davis campus and let us take eagles and owls and stuff out of these cages while they were being, you know, healing from whatever they're doing. There's a big vet school there. Um, we had, uh, if you've ever eaten a strawberry, it was, no, oh, it was probably, um, the genetic testing on all that stuff was done by a member of our ward who's, who's passed on now, but there's all this, um, agricultural and veterinarian stuff in Davis. We had a Marine biologist. So when I was 16, we um, 
we cut cord wood as a scout troop and we delivered like 30 cords of wood, saved up all this money. And the marine biologist took us to the, the very tip of Baja and we went scuba diving for 10 days. So we had some really cool things because of this university town that, you know, maybe you don't get other places, but we still thought Utah did it better than we did as Mormons. Yeah. Did you you felt like me. Totally. Totally. Oh, yeah. Just, I just realized that I passed on my competitive... We can come to their story. Later? Later, yeah. Okay. Let's do it chronologically. All right. Okay. And I'm just going to do just a brief little coaching moment. Like, as I coach people in Mormon transition, people struggling with their, struggling with their faith, leaving their faith, um, and, so, so, you know, there are a lot of things that I'm, I'm very confident about. I'm confident that... Parents can raise healthy, happy children in or out of Mormonism. I'm confident that people can find good mental health in and out of Mormonism. I'm confident that people can find spirituality in and out of Mormonism. I'm confident that people can deal with death, you know, in or out of religious belief. One thing I'm not confident about yet is exactly how to find a really robust, amazing, cohesive community outside of religion because if yeah. you think about mm -hmm. what you guys just said and i'm sure joanna you've got some stories too what youth let's just say kids raised secularly in a home that isn't really connected you know maybe there's soccer you know maybe there's school stuff or whatever but yoga studio with mom but but like what a phenomenal upbringing where you're doing interesting things meeting interesting people connecting with really interesting members of the community and as progressive and post-Mormons, we have not figured out exactly how to do that yet. Okay. That's part of what the Thrive Conference that we're going to be doing soon is starting to think about. Mm -hmm. But but what, I mean, let's just be fair. There's good and bad in Mormonism. That's the good stuff, right, Scott? Yeah, yeah. You know, my parents, even though they weren't these super deep um, doctrinal people, um, I remember one of, my, one of my most spiritual experiences as a youth was our patriarch, who was his name was Francis Broadbent. He's also passed, but I just loved him. He was on his deathbed, and um, so I was the only priest, and um, or no, I was the only priest who was a senior in high school. The other were two more younger than me, but I got the job to organize taking him the sacrament every Sunday. And he only lived a couple blocks away from the chapel, and we would drive over there, and he would come out of his bedroom in his pajamas. And we would bless the sacrament and he would take it and he would barely say thank you because he was so sick. And he'd get up and go back into his bedroom and he would weep. And I, I felt all of that. I still, you know, still, I still remember how, how powerful that was to me. And he was this example. I couldn't have explained it to you at 16, 17, like, you know, all that was going on there. But I knew there was something there that was, that was positive. So, you know, the, we, all, we had these opportunities that were really unique because of the church, and those were good things. Yeah, and, I, and I've never forgotten the people that I met growing up in Houston and the, and the leaders that helped me and the f cool activities I was a part of in the community. Yeah. I, I still aspire for progressive and post-Mormons to find a way to get that because I think it's a loss. Joanna, you were talking about that that spiritual experience uh at uh, did you get to say everything you wanted to say about that spiritual experience um at just at 14 that's where between 14 and 15 i i'm getting emotional now too that's good <laughs> i um started dealing with depression which was very foreign to me because my whole life i'd just been running around and just you know, myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was a hard time just figuring out who I was. And just as all most teens go through that, you know, you start to think of yourself independently from your family and who am I individually. And anyway, I remember my mom, another spiritual experience I had, um, a typical Sunday, we never missed church. We never did anything on Sunday. We didn't, uh, because it's the Sabbath. We would wear church clothes <laughs> all day. 
Um, Scott, she just threw your family under the bus. No, no, no. I'm just saying, like, this is a. I just. <laughs> we had ties off in the car. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which sounds lovely. Um, anyway, I. One Sunday, I came home from church and I was stomping downstairs, and we had to wear nylons back then. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even when I was millennials, married, millennials were like, "What's that?" Even yes. even when I was what married, is, I remember my mom. I was going to the right. temple, and she said, "You're not wearing nylon to the temple." And I was, you know, like 30s. <laughs> um, anyway, so I was coming home. I was 15, stomping down the stairs, you know, ripping off the stupid nylons, and just angry and mad, and just just the world was horrible. And I remember my mom coming down. <sighs> Sorry. And she's she just hugged me and she's like, I'm so worried about you. I just see you're not happy and I'm just so worried about you. And so she she held my hand and knelt by my bed and she offered the sweetest prayer. Um just asking God to help me know that I was loved and that um and I felt it again, just a very strong um, answer. And I can, those two experiences in my youth um, helped me get through these next 30 years afterwards, going through with the, the, the changes that we have these last few years, getting through, um, figuring out what I believe individually. And, but those, I call them my touchstones. I have a few others later. Um, my freshman year in college and then my sophomore year in college where I had spiritual experiences with God that were just between me and him. So um, I'm grateful for that, that my mom spent that time and, and I knew that she loved me and was cared about me regardless of how I was acting or whatever. But anyway, so that was a good experience. And that's just another thing that religions can provide, you know. What's wrong with feeling unconditionally loved by a deeply loving entity? Entity, and, right. And if, you know, the teaching about a God, an all-loving God, if, if you get taught about the right God, the right Jesus, right? It's a loving and, and compassionate and all-knowing deity. Yeah. yeah. And that can make a kid, when a kid's feeling insecure and inadequate and, you know, clumsy and awkward and whatever else you feel what's wrong with feeling love well not just right? that but i th i think it's that love is making you feel that there's something bigger out there yeah like, meaning and purpose meaning and, and purpose yeah. like you said it doesn't have to be it can be over any um religion or any atheism or whatever you, it, there's just something more and it's good to feel it's good to when feel. you're a kid when you tap into that yeah. it's basically when you're depressed or have a lot of anxiety you're feeling like life feels so crummy I don't want to do this. Yeah. So you need some reason to keep going. Yeah. Because sometimes the, the, the sadness or the anxiety is just too much. It's, you're going to blow and up. So religion yeah. can just kind of often play that role of saying, here's why. Here's why to endure the pain and the sadness and the suffering. There's an afterlife. Or you'll see your family again. Yeah. Or Heavenly Father has a plan for you. Or you're loved. Or whatever it is. Yeah. It just makes this. It, religion makes the suffering of life at least bearable, bearable, if not purposeful. And, helps and you, that's nice. It helps you hang on and get through things. Yeah. Which yeah. sometimes it's all you have. Ambiguity is really tough. And yeah. so to have concrete it answers, sucks. to know the answers is incredibly comforting. Yeah. Um, because a lot of life is just stuff happens and, you know, there's not an explanation for everything. But yeah. sometimes, you know, when you're in, you, re you do have an answer for everything, even if it's just. Well, we don't know, but we endure and it'll work out. Like sometimes that's the answer and you felt good about it. So any other stories you guys want to share before you kind of meet each other? Mission or, or youth or whatever. Let's make sure you guys. What do you think I'm going to share? I have a problem <laughs> of sharing too much. Um, no. What are you talking about? Well, you know what she's talking about. It's coming later. <laughs> no, there's yeah, yeah. We can no, talk about that. No. Anyway, okay. So, sexuality. Anything no, 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 about no. teenage no, or? I, I have one other memory <gasps> that I wanted to share um, with my upbringing and, and who I was when I was a Laurel. I remember a a lesson that we had. It was talking about goals in your life and blah blah blah. And I remember going out on in the 
the lawn of the church house and we all she said okay take some again take some time by yourself and think about you know where you see yourself in five years and in 20 years and you know and write down those goals and make them goals for yourself and so you know I had the usual thing of go to BYU and get married in the temple and um go on a mission and uh, I even had you know, I was 16, 17, I wanted to be a mission president, like mission president's wife, like that. I just thought that'd be awesome. Um, Because we had missionaries quite often in our house, and I just, I I loved missionary work. So anyway, um, I thought that was interesting looking back, that even that young, that those were my, like, benchmarks, that I, I'm going to get married in the temple, and so it's kind of like, set these goals, and then that's, that could become a fact, you know? So when you're, when you're given choices later in your life, remember these goals and those choices are, will be influenced because you've already made this decision to be married in the temple. So, yeah. Yeah. The story that I remember is that the, the story of the train and the conductor and something about having to make a choice between you know the little kid on the gonna, tracks someone's on the yeah. tracks and someone's going to die but if you decide beforehand what you're going to do then when you're in the moment right, right. so yeah. people aren't going to die because you knew ahead of time what you were going to do I, I remember those sorts of object lessons or seminary lessons right. yeah where, where they kind of drill it into you mission Maybe temple you marriage know. kids yeah. you know church activity yeah yeah Anything else you want to share? Um, I, you know, I, I, I said earlier, I, I mean, I wasn't really much of a student of either high school or the church. Um, but right towards the time I was leaving home, I got my patriarchal blessing. My parents had uh, ordained, I was ordained an elder before I went to school. I mean, I still, I didn't know what I was doing. But, but the patriarchal blessing thing was a big deal. And that was like, for me, like one of those first little inklings of there's a lot here, you know, to sink my teeth into. And we had two patriarchs because the other one was still sick. He actually didn't die. He lived for a long time. Okay. And so they called another one. And, and this man happened to be our family's home teacher my whole life. And he was the sweetest man, wonderful man. And he gave me one of those five page. Ten page. Well, yeah, it's not that long, but it's, you know, and it's, <laughs> I have the patriarchal blessing that ticks kind of all the boxes. It's got the pre-existence. T- tell and, our non-Mormon listeners what a, what a patriarchal blessing is. Okay, please. so in every church stake, which is like a region of a... Here, like in our area, it's like five towns. It's the county, basically, is the stake. And um, there's one man who is called to this position called Patriarch, and he gives a once-in-a-lifetime blessing to each person. Typically, it's done when you're a youth. And he came over. Oh, too, and he came over, and and he came to the house, to our house, to do it because we knew him. And he'd been in our house a million times. And he gave me this blessing. And the blessing is a patriarchal blessing is supposed to be like your own personal scripture. That's typically how we were taught about it. God talks to you through this patriarch. It's a one-time deal in your life, and then it gets, you get a printed copy, and you take it with you. A lot of the, I remember a lot of missionaries would have it shrunk down to like the size of their scriptures and laminated. And they'd put it in their scriptures because it was just personal scripture. And I had this one that was like five pages, and I always felt like that was kind of awesome. Yeah, you know, that, bigger is better, mostly. right? Yeah, yeah, mostly me. <laughs> um, and it mentions the preexistence, and it says that Heavenly Father personally put His hands on my head and gave me all these talents and. That Heavenly Mother prays for my well-being to the Father. And it talks about my siblings, which was odd. And I remember my mother for years would say, remember what your blessing says. You're supposed to be a leader with your siblings, which is just totally unfair to my siblings who are all adults. But um, It's very Nephi. And it was very unfair to me too, by the way. But, yeah, yeah. Um, but there's, there's very Book of Mormon though, yeah. Nephi and Laman and Lemuel. Yeah, and, and I also got the big one, or the other two big ones that sometimes you hear about. <laughs> one was that I would, I would be a, a holy disciple, which of course I read as apostle. I mean, you were going to be an apostle. Oh in your yeah, mind. I mean, I. <laughs> and now I honestly didn't figure this kind of stuff out until I was a missionary, and I was pretty sure I was going to be an apostle. Um, uh, but but going then back, you know, in the mission field and reading it, I'm like. Okay, there's some stuff here. Um, 
And the other thing it said was that my wife and I had met in the pre-existence and we had made a covenant. I've seen that smile other. somewhere before. That's me, man. Yeah. <laughs> and in that part to me, that was the, that was the real nugget. Cause I was, you know, 18 or whatever at the time it became important to me. And I then I went on a mission and I'm like, all right, there's, you know, this. and, and that was incredibly meaningful to me. And so, and then I went to Rick's and I had some really good religion classes and I had some, some spiritual experiences there. So I, I kind of caught the bug at Rick's, which my parents were right. They sent me to Rick's Just and I caught the time. vision. Yeah. Just in time. Just in time. Yeah. Yeah. And I always felt bad for the missionaries who go out at 18 because that year of college was a big deal for me because I was pretty immature at, coming out of high school. But that year away, even though you're kind of, everything's taken care of, just being away really helped me. And I bet it helped a lot of missionaries to just get one year away from mama before you head off into who knows where with a mission call. So, so then I got ready and put in papers like everybody else on my dorm and we started going on missions. And just to talk about patriarchal blessings for a bit, I, it, it's a really important part of a, of a Mormon youth's life because can be, yeah, huge. because you feel like it's God's communication to you directly. You're per, like you said, personal scripture. Yeah. I remember it, it, you know, and when you're told you're going to be a leader in the church or in my case, I was told that I would come forth in the morning of the first resurrection, which to me meant I had made the highest degree yeah. of the celestial kingdom. I got that too. John. You, you got that too. Yeah. 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 Well, no, this is, this is the point is that, is that we all think it's very personal. We think it's from God. We think, you know, you're going to get married in the temple. Of course, you never hear a patriarchal blessing. Wow, unfortunately, you won't be married in the temple. <laughs> and you won't go on a mission. And you won't be a leader in the you're church. You're going to be an adulterer. You know? yeah. And actually, the way, the way it turns out is these patriarchs pretty much give a template blessing to almost everyone that's almost identical. But because you're taught in the church not to ever share, it's too sacred. Don't ever share your patriarchal blessing with others. Nobody knows that actually this patriarch is giving largely the same blessing to everybody. But having said all that, and even though it can be egotistical, and even though, you know, some would say it's superstitious, when you're a kid and you get this thing and it says all this personal stuff that's promising you all these big things, it gives you a sense of, of a confidence. It gives and you a direction. sense of purpose and mission and excitement and a un unique empowerment. And it's, it's a really, I don't know you, if you're being cynical, you could say it's sort of an insidious effective thing, but if you're spiritual, you can just say it's a powerful thing, right? Yeah. And, and so being born and raised and living in the same town, basically my whole life, I had the, you know, the opportunity to know the men who are the patriarchs. So in my lifetime, we've had three in the stake and two of more in my ward. One was the home teacher. So like we knew these men. So when, when and there's, and there's kind of this reverence, like, Ooh, oh. They, oh, you're in the home of the patriarch. And, okay. So oh. I used to tell my kids if the prophet or brother Broadbent calls and he was the patriarch <laughs> and says, start heading to Missouri. You, you just go. start heading. You just go. Don't ask questions. You know, and that's, <laughs> that's how we looked at him. And, um, but I will say in defense of patriarchs, these men that I know personally who are, have been patriarchs, I guarantee you they absolutely take it seriously. They believe. They have felt serious spiritual promptings. They put time into it. I remember my parents getting mad at me because I rescheduled the blessing a couple times because I was 17. You know, I had a date or whatever. Um, but when he came, I remember him saying, oh, well, thanks for not changing again because I was fasting. So yeah, they've been fast. fasting like three times and I'd canceled on it. <laughs> um, and so, and, and this, and the man who, who gave me mine is still alive. And I, I, I admire him to this yeah. day, I, you know, and I really think because he knew me and our family, he knew my parents. I think he was able to think about me a little bit before that blessing. So that, it was Sometimes it can be personal. Yeah, it wasn't entirely canned. Right, it was, right, it was sure. Really, and I still look oh, at you, it. You, still, I, you think you're still special, basically. You think you are special. No, I mean, I'm you're special. Still. That's not a <laughs> debate, you know. Like, um. <laughs> but there's this term in Mormonism called spiritual giant. And it just means someone who's like godly. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, oh yeah. And patriarchs, are, yeah. patriarchs are usually yeah. viewed as spiritual giants, totally. right? Yeah. All right. Anything else either of you yeah. want to say kind of pre about patriarchal blessings anything about your childhood before you met oh well did you serve a mission joanna i did oh wow who served first Me. well we are serving the same mission remember oh well, no i don't remember oh. but, but now i'll remember now that you sorry i just it, said but... that 
No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, Spoilers. So, but, but, we, but I had... Spoiler alert. I had actually a little bit of a life. I'm two years older than Scott. Okay, good. So I had more college life than he did. He went to Rick's as a freshman, took Book Mormon class, and was like, wow, this is... This I think this could be real, and for me, I, I no, I'm just saying like that's how that's and then you want a mission and then we met. For me, I am. Um, she's with, so arrogant. Well, she's snooty. She's, her she's, her. She's the righteous one, John. You well, see that? To yeah. be fair, you did fail algebra three times in high school. Oh, oh. Okay. Grounded. <laughs> anyway, so I went to BYU. Absolutely. Loved it. Oh, you went to BYU. The, oh, yeah. the BYU. The, See, the that's, Y. That's an upgrade from your p- p- puny little Ricks. <laughs> I didn't even apply because I knew I wouldn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, graduated from high school in 88 and then went to BYU like two weeks later. Um, and I just absolutely loved it. Loved everything about BYU. Um just loved it. Loved was Holland. Holland was the president, right? He was. Yeah. He and Pat were the yeah. president and Mrs. And um, I met lots of great people, lots of great guys. So I dated. dated <laughs> were you in the I, dorms? Were you in dorms? I was in the dorms. Which yeah. Which dorms? Healing or DT? Or, DT. Yeah. Okay. All right. T Tower two 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 was my first room, um, and then afterwards lived off campus as my friends started getting married and peeling away. I had a couple of very serious boyfriends and, um, those obviously didn't work out. So at 22, I went on a mission and went, was called to Toronto. No, I just, Oh yeah. I remember that now. And I just have to say that, and uh, you know, I'm going to put you on the spot. This is one of my Mormon stories, tough questions Mm -hmm. back in the day before the Thomas S. Monson revelation that all, you know, pretty much all worthy girls should serve missions. There was sort of the stereotype that like all men had to serve missions, but, but basically it was either the women who couldn't find a husband yeah. or the less attractive women had to serve, you know, would serve missions, but, but the attractive or the eligible ones wouldn't. So, to, you know, did you, did you know about that and how did you, did you think about that at all or? Did you? I didn't think about that. <laughs> I don't mean I'm not trying to be rude, but I don't know. Feel that is a thing. Was woman. that a thing, Scott? Was that a thing? <laughs> Basically, that was totally a thing. Okay. I mean, it was, and in you know, our mission had 225 missionaries, and maybe there were 25 sisters. I mean, it wasn't there weren't a lot of sisters. And and there's the, this is really rude, but there's the term sweet spirit, which was a euphemism euphemism for what. You never heard it? Oh, no, heard it? we know. We just don't want to say it. <laughs> it means you're ugly. Well, I mean, a less, a less eligible sister. Yeah, I mean, you, this is rude stuff, but it is a, it no, is a thing. No, so. if, if the guys are sitting around and say she's pretty, she's pretty, she's a sweet spirit. But you, you clearly terrible, thought yeah. Joanna was hot, so I mean, she wasn't a sweet well, spirit. You know, we met in the mission field, so there's. I'm going to tell that part of the story because I get it right. <laughs> All right, so uh, Joanna, you go first. So Toronto. By the way, the Raptors are about to win the Eastern Conference Finals, so yeah. shout out to Toronto. Shout out to Toronto. They don't know what basketball um, is. Scott has already asked that he tell the story, and then I will come back and amend it. No, because, no, no, you go first. Well, for, for literally our children's entire existence, until we left the church, we would have missionaries here. We, we love missionaries. We, our goal as a couple was to go and be mission presidents. Like, okay, let's get our finances together. Let's get things so we can go and, and um, serve the missionaries. So we had missionaries at our home. Every single day. Well, no. Oh, every week. But every week every we week. would. Mm-hmm. And, and whenever we get new missionaries, uh, Scott would tell his a different version of how we met. So. <laughs> and we give them all a San Francisco Giants hat because we wanted to make sure that when the missionaries left here spread that we the spread the good word of Giants baseball. So, <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I think he wanted you to go first. No. Okay. Whatever. All right. So I went on a mission. Um, I was, I left in September of 91. I got to the MTC and, um, I remember sitting in the MTC. Uh, actually my parents put me on a plane in Sacramento and I landed in Salt Lake. It was the first time I'd ever flown anywhere by myself. And there were supposed to be people waiting there for you. And I was of course nervous and there was nobody there. And I looked around, I looked around, I couldn't find anybody. Finally, I found this van that was supposed to take us because there were other missionaries there looking lost. 
And we got to the MTC after we, they piled us all in the van and I was one of two males in the van. So of course they piled the luggage on top of the boys. This is, you know, we drove to Provo. I got there at like seven o'clock that night. They had called my mother to find out if I was still coming because I didn't show up on time. And my mother thought I was dead on the side of the road somewhere. And I ended up, that's how I got to the MTC that day. And it was, my parents were <laughs> completely a mess. They thought I was dead. Anyway, I get to the MTC a couple, you know, I was only there two and a half, three weeks. And I was there just long enough so that we were going over the third discussion, which was the restoration. So apostasy, restoration of the gospel. And I remember having this thought in my head, powerful. Oh, I get it. That's why Joseph Smith is so important. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> so wait, that, how old are you again? Well, I was 19. I was in a missionary name tag in the MTC. And okay. I, just want, just you. wanted to so make like, sure. I, I'm pretty sure I could have recited all the books in the Book of Mormon and the New Testament, like those kinds of bare minimum requirements. But I mean, I just didn't know anything. But it hit me and I dove in and I just dove into the books did you get like Jesus the Christ, all the Talmud books, Jesus the, the Christ. The four books you were allowed to take. What, Jesus Marvelous Christ. Work and a Wonder, yep. Truth Restored. Grand Richards, Truth Restored. Um, Jesus, uh, Jesus the Christ. Christ. Marvelous Articles Work and a Wonder. Articles of Faith. Yeah, 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 Articles of Faith. Mar yeah. Mar 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 yeah. Yeah. So, so. Miracle Forgiveness. I became, well, no. Um, <laughs> that's later. That was allowed. Yeah. I, Unfortunately. Yeah, so I, like a lot of missionaries, I dove in and became very proficient in the missionary stuff. So the discussions... I became a whiz. The books we were could read, those four books, I totally ate them up. Um, so it was not a well-rounded education in church history or doctor or anything, but as far as what the missionaries had on their plate to read and study, I mean, I just couldn't get enough of it. And I fell in love. I mean, I just, I got to the mission field and I, I just ate it up. I, I fit right into the environment, the culture of let's get out there and save the world. We were going to baptize everybody we meet. We were inviting people to baptism on the doorstep. I mean, we were, it was awesome. I mean, it, I just loved it. My first day in the mission field, this mission president, who I, I had two mission presidents for the two halves of my mission. They finished in the summertime. And the first mission president idea was the day you land, he wanted you teaching. So all trainers had to have teaching appointments lined up that night. We landed met the president, got our assignment and we were out the door. And that night I was teaching a fourth discussion, which I could, you know, I, I became proficient later. Like I was just out of the MTC. That was like plan of salvation, plan right? of salvation. Yeah. I barely knew any of it at, at that moment. Right. And I can still remember that moment about as clearly as I can remember anything in my mission, uh, the room we were sitting in this Jamaican woman we were teaching the sun setting in the window behind her, the TV was on and I couldn't stop looking over at the TV and I was exhausted because I was new. And, but to me that was like, yeah, this is awesome. Like we're going to burn the candle at both ends and we're going to go save the world. Even though I don't know anything, I'm going to. And uh, a couple of months in my trainer was friends with one of the APs and he came over and spent the day with us. And a, a, a strong cultural thing in our mission we called travels. And so the zone leader or the APs or the district leader would come and spend a day with either just you and split up the companionship or they'd spend, they would get a, a, a split for their companion in their own area. And then they would come and spend a day with both of you and do companion study and plan and work and all that stuff. And we did a lot of that. And um, so this AP came and this guy was so awesome and he knew not only was he knowledgeable, he could teach. He just was a very effective teacher. And I saw that and, and it was kind of, oh, that's, that's what I'm going to be. I'm going to, that guy. Cause, and, and, and he, and he also had no ego, which same here, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I too. And, yeah. extraordinary right. and, and so, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll remember, and I, you know, I thought a lot about this because you hear people say things like, oh, that leadership guy, he was sucking up to become a leader and everything. I equated being in leadership with being a great missionary. And, and people don't like to say that because it's kind of embarrassing. But to me, that was the only course. Like, I'm going to be the best missionary I can be. And 
So I remember this really snowy day walking through this field to go knock on doors and having this real serious conversation with God and saying, I, I want to be the best. I will work all day, every day. And I wanted to be able to get off the plane and look at my dad in the eye and tell him that I had worked hard every day of my mission. And I, and I did. And that was like the reward for two years of service was telling that to my dad. <clears throat> but I fell in love with the mission. I loved the leadership stuff. I just thought it was why we were there. I didn't understand the missionaries who weren't working. It didn't make sense to me because you didn't have to be there. Um, and so it probably a little bit because of my background, I wasn't forced to go on a mission. So I just couldn't quite get my head around why anybody would not work when they're there. Like, so did why? you make Zoni or anything? John, I was an AP. Okay. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, I have a good, very good friend who was a bishop <laughs> earlier than I was. But he wasn't an AP, and I just, if he ever listens to this, I want him to know I'm thinking about him. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing, but I'm laughing, but the reason this is funny is because we all know this is part of the culture. Yeah. I mean, if you're called to be the zone leader or the AP. I was just a zone leader. Yeah, well, you know, hey, we can't all rise to the top. So <laughs> it narrows the gate. Yeah, yeah, it narrows the gate. Um, but one of the things I was good at was teaching. I was a really good teacher, and I, I still am a good teacher. It's one of the things I do all the time with my business. And I it's just, you know, there's a lot of things I do really bad, but that's one thing I do well. And no ego. Well, you, you, were, you were blessed with that in your patriarchal blessing. I was blessed with that in my patriarchal blessing, yeah. But I, I did, and I loved it, and I loved training the other missionaries. Like, I was, I loved it. I was also a real hard ass, but that also was the leadership culture. So if somebody wasn't working, we didn't put our arm around them and say, come on, man, you can do better. We said, what the heck is wrong with you? <laughs> well, yeah. So I had these, I, my first zone leader job, I was, uh, I went up North. So, which was fun now with game of Thrones, I went to the great white North. So we called it the North zone and it was North. I, we, I was in Toronto, Canada, just like Joanna. And um, this zone was geographically bigger than the entire rest of the mission. It was just huge. It just kind of went straight north to the North Pole. And, um, and there were only five areas, but you couldn't get to any of them less than three-hour drive. So I actually had two cars and two companions. And I would take one of the cars and just take off and go spend a day or two with each of these different companionships. And the other two guys would stay in the ward and, and work. And that was because it was just such a big area. You'd go alone? I would go alone. Ooh. And the mission president blessed it because it's just practically that's the only thing you could do. Hmm. Um, one area, I had to take a train six hours north. And I got to ride a train through northern Ontario in the fall through the lakes and maples alone. alone and it was amazing. It was hmm. beautiful. So I had these sisters in the in the zone and they hated me and i hated them and because i was a superstar and they weren't working right i mean that was sort of the that was well no i'm just saying i you know and i was i wanted us all to work and baptize and we all and i wanted to make sure every area in our zone baptized every month that was the goal yeah basically this is like nephi versus his brothers yeah right? well similar his sisters they're not really in the book yeah anyway well why would sisters be in the so book? Anyway, can I finish my story? All right. So we, <laughs> we, we always, we had, and this is probably common in a lot of missions. We had our weekly numbers call in. So you would call in to your leader and report all the numbers. And so, you know, this is 91, 92. So we didn't have email and all that stuff. So we would say, how many discussions? Five. How many first discussions? Two. How, you know, and, and how many book of Mormons did you give out? How many baptism dates? And you know, this whole report. Yeah, all those kinds of things. And they didn't like me. So this one night, I would say, how many doors do you knock on? Zero. <laughs> how many discussions? Zero. How many member visits? Zero. And all the way down the list, it was zero. And they were just, they were just trying to get my goat. And It's because you were insufferable. It was because I was insufferable. And they were right. They had me. <laughs> they had me. They knew exactly how to get under my skin. And I got mad. And I said, this pisses me off. That's, huh. Those were my words. And I said, then I, of course I went on some rant about why are they even bothering? They should be home, you know, making cookies if they didn't want to work. I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm being vulnerable here, everybody. So forgive me. All right. Um, anyway, and, 
And then finally, the last thing I said was, you're both a pain in the ass. So <sighs> 10 minutes later, the phone rings and it's the mission president. Hmm. And this is my second mission president who, who I spent a lot more time with and the one I always think of my, as, as my president, really. And he called and he says, I just got off the phone with Sister So-and-so. Did you say pisses you off? And I said, yes. And she said, and then he said, um, did you say that she's a pain in your ass? And I said, yes. And he said, you can't do that. And I said, but she is. And he says, I know she is, but you can't say that. <laughs> And it was about three weeks later he called me to be his assistant. And I and that's I, awesome. And I swear I could hear him chuckling in the background, like he was trying not to laugh. And I imagine his wife was squeezing his hand and making him not, you know, to keep a straight face. But it was I think it was something he would have liked to have said. And it's a total boys club. Oh you know yeah, 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 yeah. And and my mission president was this very successful businessman. And I love him. I still I just love this man. He's, he's such a mentor. You couldn't pay for the mentorship I got as an AP right. to this very successful businessman. Yeah. He, he was phenomenal. And when I got there, so I was his second assistant. You know, he inherited two. Then he called one who ended up marrying Joanna's sister. And then he called me. And um, we were his first two. So we were the ones he owned, kind of. And he gave us his credit card and said, go to the store, buy some sleeping bags. Here's a phone card. So you can call wherever you want, you know, no cell phones. And he said, I don't want to see you in this office. The reason you guys are here is because you need to go train. So for the next six months, we were out of the office, not in our own areas really, but right. all over the mission yeah, yeah. by ourselves. So we were constantly, we had cars and we would just go. And he and I would partner up and say, well, let's go to this zone today. And he'd go one place and I'd go to the other and vice versa. And we loved it. It was about, we, we set a record for baptism. So the mission president took us out to a steak dinner. Well, you know, I mean, you were, you right? were for Mike. Yeah. mission baptisms, not your baptisms. Okay, it's Joanna's turn now. <laughs> so Joanna, so Joanna, was he as insufferable as he sounds, or was that hot for you? And you, and you, and you never, and you never answered whether you were sweet spirit or not. So I want to hear all that. Uh, so <laughs> I was engaged when I was 21, 2021. And then disengaged. To someone else, yeah. To, yeah, someone else. And um, and then when I was 22, I went on a mission, and my brother was in the MTC with me at the same time. He went to North Carolina, and I went to Toronto. And so all I'd never dated anybody younger than me or even really thought about it. It's because they're younger than me. So... Um, so all so all the elders on the mission. I mean, they were nice. They were boys. They yeah, and and they were fun. And they and were. You were a woman, because women are more mature than men anyway. But so, have, like in terms of maturity, you're like four years more mature than than all these missionaries, right? It was just it was just different. Like I said, we had fun with them, but I I wasn't romantically or even thinking, which was I which was one of the reasons I wanted to go on a mission, was so I could literally have a year and a half break. From, from boys. From boys. You want to get away from boys. Thinking about marriage, being stressed about who am I going to marry. Like just, it's just a year and a half of just serving people. And um, and the Lord maybe. Well, the Lord, because I one of the big reasons was I wanted to thank him for forgiving me for the sins I had committed. Wait, you never told us about your sins. <laughs> What sins did you commit? Boys in college. I'll just say boys in college. No, I want gr I want nitty gritty detail. Oh, okay. okay, so at BYU, you were messing around. People don't mess around at BYU. So, something that happened at BYU. I was I was talking about this just last Saturday night with some people. My testimony and understanding of the gospel was so such an integral part of me. It was not separate from me. It was who I was. And so I remember going to a bishop at, at BYU and talking about um, some mistakes I had made with chastity. And I myself had not taken sacrament for a while because I just thought I was so ashamed and so disappointed in myself. And I remember the bishop saying, you need to forgive yourself and, and move on. You're, you're okay. And I remember telling that bishop, but you don't understand. I, I get it. Like, I know this is real. I know the gospel. I know 
chastity is so important and I failed and I'm like, I could not forgive myself. And so, so just to be clear, a lot of chastity says, you know, no making out that gets too hot and heavy. So you were making out with boys, boys. Yes. In, in high school or college, they call it BYU. Yeah. Levi love and that kind of stuff. Right. Make it out. Levi Make it out. No, no, no. I'm just saying it's part of it. The law of chastity, this stuff, it's not any purient sort of impulses. This law of chastity stuff frames it. Religions need you to feel guilty and ashamed because then you need them to make yourself feel better or to feel yeah. whole. Yeah. And I just, it's, it's no other, I don't, there's no self satisfaction out of this for me personally, other than to make sure we capture the importance of making youth feel really ashamed and guilty. Just shame and so guilty that they and need the church. Bad. And it was a, well, what I don't want to say besides I just felt shame and guilt and horrible because I knew the gospel was true and I still made mistakes. And so after feeling like I was finally forgiven, one of the big motivators for me to go on a mission was so my my sins are white as snow like you know in the doctrine of covenants when you bring someone into the gospel your sins are forgiven and i you loved felt, missionary work anyway but um it was like I, a rebaptism almost it was and also i wanted to like prove to god and, and the savior that i was grateful for the atonement yeah. I don't know if that makes That's awesome. Yeah. I'm glad we went there. Anyway. Okay. Back to mission. What were we? Yeah, so you went on a mission. So I went on a mission. And you went you went on a mission when most women didn't, you know? Yeah, there weren't yeah. And I, I should also say we talked about sweet spirits and people that weren't married. It was also just the super committed, righteous women back then who went on missions, right? So I, this has to come from me. The sisters in the mission who were, you know, good missionaries, like, you know, there's bad, good and bad, whatever, but the sisters could outperform the elders every day of the week. They always had more baptisms. They always affected more families. And it was all about that maturity. And I think they knew more. I think they were more personable. They just, they were better. They just outperformed in every way, which of course ticked me off because, you know, they were sister missionaries, not guys, but, but they were great. The sisters we had were fantastic. Yeah. yeah, and mom. Well, most of, I mean, mo they were really yeah, great. most. Well, and you also said uh, things started changing the year that I came out. So I came in. I was there ninety two, <laughs> through part of ninety four, and you had said sisters started kind of coming who wanted to be there that weren't just the leftovers that didn't get married. Oh. <laughs> it's. Leftovers. That's leftovers. Yep. For, like for a long time when I was growing up, that's kind of... The back of the fridge. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, I loved the mission. My first area was in Windsor. There's a university there, and it's right across the river from Detroit. So the Ambassador Bridge. Um, and I was only in three areas my entire mission. So I was in three wards. Um, was super close with members in all of those wards. Um, would, you know, we had Sunday ward council with them and knew the bishops well and knew all the part member families. And we had dinners every night, sometimes lunches as well. Um, like just really got involved with the wards. Um, and in, in Windsor, I instigated, a institute because we had, there were so many younger people that we were teaching and there was nothing formed there as like just a religion class. So actually the university there let us use one of their classrooms and, and taught institute just for the Book of Mormon once a week. But anyway, um, so Toronto, everyone, has, maybe everyone doesn't know, but it's a big melting pot. A lot of people that can't get into the States go to Toronto or to BC. But so in my journal, I have a list of over a hundred nationalities of people that I individually met and talked with. And I loved that as well. That really helped me see that all kinds of walks of life, all kinds of faiths, lack of faith, just, I mean, you know, it's just was very refreshing and to find commonality with people who are Christian. Um, a, a family, a lady taught me about how she was a young girl in Odessa 
in, in Russia before they broke away and, um, and how her, her father would hold secret Christian meetings and, and the military came in and she had to jump out a window. And we taught some young men in like their twenties from R- Rwanda and this is 92, 93 and, and that genocide. And they talked about fleeing for their lives and laying down in the fields as, you know, bullets are going over their head. Um, but they talked about the Christian beliefs and, um, I loved it. And I was so excited that they could learn that there was more, you know, president Hinckley would say, you know, take what you have, but we want to give you more. And I, I loved that. I just thought this, cause this is truth. We have the truth and you can't wait to see, just wait until you find out that there's more and we have a prophet today and we have the actual authority of God. And I just, I love being a missionary. I loved every, everything about it. I have to tell you guys that my sister married a Canadian and moved to Toronto. And so my, and they were a part member family cause he was not a member. So my sister, Gina Faust lived in Orangeville and Mississauga. Yeah. Oh, Mississauga. I know. Yeah. And, um, and that was a really important part of her life Yeah, was, uh, Toronto. And, uh, yeah. I, my first area was right next to Mississauga. Um, but we, I remember teaching people from Ghana and having Ghanaian dinner. Yeah. So we would have fufu, this stuff in this bowl, and you'd eat it out of a communal dish. Very multicultural. And then we would teach, I, I remember teaching a lot of people from the West Indies. And so we would eat um, fried plantain, which I just hated. Um, but they would make these amazing meals for us. And we got to eat all this food from all over the world. Yeah. Toronto's great. It's amazing. Toronto's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. So uh, really quickly, what was... What were your reflections on Scott as a missionary, or did you ever really interact with him? He was great. He was a, he was a great kid. <laughs> no, he was. Um, I our our mission. We prided ourselves on being a mission of obedience, and that the Lord would bless us because of obedience. So obedience is the first law of heaven. First law of heaven, um, and so it was not cool in our mission to not be obedient. So. My, my first area, I had two companions, and then I was transferred to St. Catharines, which is down by Niagara Falls, has that in their ward. Um, and another sister and I um, opened that area. There had been elders there before. And um, I was in that area for s- almost eight months. And then I trained two people there. So the first half of my mission, I had two companions and the, the last year plus of my mission, I had, I trained the, the, all the last year, seven. Yeah, that's great. Different companions. But also our, not just to say that I was great, but our mission was splitting. No, no, no. I'm just saying like, so they needed more people training because they kept opening new areas and we, every month. Scott and Jordan were preparing us to split our mission. And so we were getting an influx of missionaries and anyway, let me just ask you, did it ever bug you that the, that the men got the lead, the elders got the lead and they were less mature and maybe sometimes less serious and the women were just kind of subservient. Did you ever have any feminist impulses or did you know? I think I was too much of an asshole to be, or competitive. I guess I was kind of like, well, they need to have, they need to learn these skills. And so we'll just be, we'll just be patient with them, you know, and <laughs> you actually, well, in my head, yeah. which I'm not that way anymore. Thank goodness. I don't, <laughs> am I? No. Shoot. <laughs> Shoot. No, no. Maybe by the time 80, I'll be okay. done with that. So did you guys have, did you guys have feelings for each other on your mission or not? No. Okay. Um, oh. But I was going to say, I was asked to three or four times to teach a class at zone conference. And so I felt like that was a way that I could be a leader. Yeah. I don't know. You got some scraps. Yeah. Joanna, Joanna was a a fantastic missionary. She was incredible and everybody knew it. She was great. And, um, we, we knew each other pretty about as well as an elder and a sister can know each other without dating or fooling around or whatever. We were were never in the same area. Mike. Yeah. Oh, um, I, you would say really- we were never in the same area. Um, and I mentioned earlier that in our mission, we, the leaders would go and travel a companionship alone. And I actually spent a day with Joanna and a companion once. And then like a half a day, another time. So we were driving around in the car, talking and doing missionary work together. We taught discussions together and, but that was a normal thing in our mission. It wasn't weird. 
what would have been weird is if we went to the apartment. So if, if an elder was spending a day with sisters, they would meet at a member's house, do the companion study and stuff, you know, where there's other people around and then go work for the day. So we actually knew each other pretty well. We have some pictures of us like at a lunch at a zone conference. We're in the same picture, but there really, there were never any sparks. I used to always tease the missionaries that we would make out at zone conference, but there, there wasn't anything. You guys were there. too into it. Yeah. Too and, into the and the way that it worked out was I was going home she still had about six months left. I had a girlfriend at home. I thought I was getting married when I got home. Um, and the mission president in my f- exit interview cut her address and her home address and parents name and everything out of his binder that he had and said, you need to write to sister Rudd. He, he said, what do you think about sister Rudd? And I said, and I remember I said, I love her. She's fantastic. Cause there, there wasn't any, you know, there wasn't anything. And, um, and I have to say, honestly, she was out of my league. So uh, well, it was it wasn't, she wasn't on my radar because I didn't think she could be on the radar. Um, and he said, you need to write to her. And I said, no, not a chance. There's no way. She's a sister. And, you know, I don't get along with whatever. We were playful. And, um, and then I went home. And it was shortly after that she started writing me. And this is the part that she doesn't get right but she wrote me first and then, with no address or no idea where he was doesn't matter no one's gonna care yeah <laughs> so anyway we started we wrote a couple of letters so i was back at school and i was dating girls and having a lot of fun and i remember sending her a picture of me and a whole bunch of girls from my ward that i intentionally took so that i could send it to her <laughs> so i think once i got home i started thinking about it and then she got home in like february 94 94 and she calls me and she said, are you going to come to my homecoming? And I said, yeah, of course I'm planning on coming down for it. And then I started hearing about all these guys from our mission that were going to show up at her homecoming and half the mission showed up to her homecoming because they all wanted to go out with her. That's a lie. And so I didn't go. <laughs> I just was like, I'm not going to do, I'm not showing up to the meat wagon. You know, I'm not going doing that. <laughs> and, um, and then she was ticked off that I didn't show up. So Oh, I have to lean this yeah, way. A little bit. Sorry. Yeah. You're so she's off camera. So I, I, I <laughs> no, wish I could say straight I, is fine. I wish I could say I did this on purpose, but she, um, she was bothered that I wasn't, um, I was anxious bothered. enough to go to her her homecoming. So she called me that night to find out this where I was. This is where her story, and I have to start saying Scott. No, this Scott. is where. I, and anyway, so we started talking on the phone. I was actually on a date, watching a movie at my apartment, and she called, and about an hour later, she says, "What are you doing?" And I said, oh, I'm on a date. <laughs> and I just spent an hour on the phone with Joanna. So we met down in, I had a brother in Logan. And My family had moved to Bountiful when I was at BYU. Right. So they were in Bountiful then. And so, so. we arranged to meet in Logan. And uh, we met there. And conveniently, my brother was out of town. And what our, well, my parents never heard about it. But what her parents thought was she was staying with some friends. And we went out to dinner. We tried, we tried to go see the Rocky Horror Picture Show because we didn't have any idea what that was. And it was like 20 minutes of profanity and vulgarity before the movie started. And we left before the movie started, which, of course, she thought I was the bravest man alive. And then we went uh, back to the apartment and made out all night. So that was our first date. Have you guys ever heard that version of the story? No? No. no. True confessions right here. Yeah. Um, and I was in love. That was it. That was the last date I ever, I never went on another date. And then I had girl. to leave and go back because I had another date that night. <laughs> 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 back, back in Bountiful. But I got to say that f- before she left after this first date, I, this is so Mormon. I said, I'm not dating anybody else. I'm only dating you until we play this thing out and see how it works. And I would like you to do the same. Like, who does that? That's so dumb. And she said, okay. And then she went, went on her date. <laughs> Your turn. Oh, so I got home February. We dated and he was just so much fun. And a big thing for me, because I had dated so much before and um, was engaged before and, and all of that, I was able to see Scott in a, in a light, in a role where I wasn't thinking about dating him or marrying him or anything like that. I could see who he was without the whole, 
attraction or you know what I mean? Like without being influenced by that. And that was very important to me because I, uh, spirituality was number one for me on who I was going to marry. I needed to know that the person I was going to marry loved God first, honestly. And it wasn't just putting on a show to, you know, say, Oh yeah, I'd love God and everything like that, but then not really be that way. So I was able to see Scott in his role as missionary and I knew that he truly loved God and that, and, and I, that was attractive to me. So, so that is why I, we started dating then we had so much fun and then we fell in love and we were engaged by June 1st. Like our first kiss was like in March. Married August 10th. Very Mormon. Salt Lake Very City. Mormon. Yeah. 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 But again, when he, when we first even brought up getting married, he had me read his patriarchal blessing. Mm-hmm. And I felt like it was talking about me. I, I just really... What parts of it do you remember? Uh, that he... That, well, the one part. It, that we knew each other in our preexistence. Um, mm-hmm. And also that he was going to be a leader in the church. Like I said, I, that was very important to me because I, I wanted someone who was dedicated to the gospel more than trying to um, fake it with me or something. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like not just trying to get me to fall in love with him, but like he himself was dedicated to the gospel and God, which in my mind meant the church. There's, we're, we're touching on this weird dynamic that, uh, that I dealt with too. Um, you know, Jesus, when you think about Jesus and the virtues that he exhibited, Jesus is supposed to be about humility, right? Kindness. And, and there's a, a Mormon thing where you don't aspire to callings, right? Mm-hmm. So on the one hand, as a Mormon, you're supposed to be humble and not aspire to callings. On the other hand, you know, you, you want to, you, we all lust to be, you know, bishop and then stake president and then general authority or mission president. I mean, every what Mormon boy who's devout doesn't want that. Right. And as a woman, you, you want to follow that trail too. So on the one hand, you're wanting to be humble and uh, not aspire. And on the other hand, you're totally aspiring for high callings. And it's it's kind of a little bit of a well, and paradox, I'm, right? I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because this was something I always had in the back of my mind, knowing that how people were turned off by this as, aspiring for a calling thing. Yeah. At the same time, I felt like that's what God put me here to do. Yeah, I, I didn't feel there was... And I, I understood clearly... How it, how it could look. I got it. And I knew guys that were just kind of jerks and trying to climb the ladder. And I, I just I just felt like that was my purpose. Yeah, I know. I mean, but I, but I, it's it was, a paradox, right? Oh, it is totally a paradox. But it was, it's, the, you, those guys that are in those positions are really sincere. Of course, of yeah. course. Yeah, it's, yeah, everyone's sincere. Yeah. And I'm just noting that you've got the patriarchal blessing that's like, see, God, God's, yeah. you know, hey, hey, Joanna, look, God says I'm going to be a big leader in the church. And that's one of your check boxes. It so was. here's the patriarchal blessing so that you could check out the box so that you'll marry me. Well, and that, that I'm the right guy for you. <laughs> right. So the, yeah, when back when you were 16, 17, you want to be a mission president. I'll, I'm the, I'm your guy. Cause, and, it, and it was like, because I, like I had the truth and the, the world needs to know this truth. So I need someone by my side that that really believes this and gets this and wants to spread the gospel to the ends that are, I mean, like. Yeah. yeah. And and how did she fit your check boxes? Did she? She was really good looking lady. <laughs> and um, she's got. You said was. Was. I just you heard that was. too. He's oh. heard that too. Was. I was thinking about 93, honey. That was back Nin- then. 94. Yeah. 94. That is right. true. Nice, That's nice true. Recovery. Thanks, man. Yeah. Um, 100 no, pounds she, ago. She, I, I, I mean. It, she, she we went on our me. first date our first our first date actually was before the one we went on because I was with my sister and she was with another guy and it was like this group thing and we ended up driving back together so I mean it, we we fit so easily and the mission president told me as recently as six months ago he said I always knew that if I had you two in the same area we would have problems even though neither of us felt that in the mission field he he said he could see it and I believe him because it was just, I mean, we, I was done after one date. I mean, I was just in love. She, and so how did she fill your checkboxes? She fit she everything. Was she was beautiful. And what I else? have to say the same thing she said. I knew her as a missionary. She was, she was smart. 
she worked her tail off. I mean, she worked. That was to me really Some important. Character, hardworking, yes. smart, yep. spiritual. I love the fact spirit. that she had this like Idaho country girl thing inside of her, you know, cause that was awesome. I grew up hunting and fishing and that kind of stuff. And we, we fit, I mean, we just fit easy. It, yeah. And, I, that's one of the things that I think that helped my mom and my dad when we got engaged so fast because I had been engaged before and they're like, Joanna, what are you what? And she used to always bring home these quarterbacks no, and she, then she brings home this, you know, no. the Pillsbury Doughboy who's cracking jokes <laughs> and, and, and her parents have no idea how to handle no, no, this. No, no, I'm just saying that like, I, I didn't, I could be, I could be authentic with you. I yeah. could, I could be myself. I, it was easy. It, it was, it was, it was just, we just fit. We didn't have to do the thing that a lot of LDS couples do where you have to prove what you were in the mission field. Like all this stuff. You knew it. We actually saw it. I could yeah, see yeah. it without yeah. dating him. Before yeah. there was any sparks. Um, nice. But I did go to the temple and take it to the Lord because I was going to marry that girl from the patriarchal blessing. And, and frankly, I had the most profound sacred experience of my life um in the chapel you know not like during the ordinances or anything but i i think i was sincere enough and maybe um young enough that i i mean it said there's this girl in the blessing it said you've made a covenant i've done what i'm supposed to do she's got to be it i go to the temple and you know was hit with this thing that i was so unexpected what was the thing? <sighs> what did it tell you? I, it was like a memory. And I still hold this very sacred. Um, but I'll, I'll share this in that context. But it was like a memory that I'd seen her before. And, um, and I, I mean, I knew as certainly as anything I knew that that's her. It was her face. And... I mean, I was already in love, but it was over, and, and, and I wasn't going to let her not marry me at that and point. And it was you know, after like, that, that that I got off work, and then he, he came and had me read that blessing, and, and then told me about the temple experience. and um, Which is really not fair to her. Am I too quiet? Sorry. You know, no pressure, honey. Here's the blessing, and oh, by the way, I already know it's you, and so let's do this. No, it can it, be coercive, but, yeah. but, it but wasn't, in this case, it, it wasn't. wasn't. Joanna's no, saying it's not. It wasn't. And How then, was it for you, Joanna? Mm. It was, it was, again, I, I felt, I felt a confirmation for myself that this is, this, he's, he's the one. Yeah. So. And so we didn't have the big romantic proposal. We sat down, we talked this out, we were in love and we said, all right, let's call the temple. We picked up the te- well, phone and I, I, <laughs> and I made was, an appointment to get married. I was. And then working, we called our parents. I was an e- <laughs> EFY counselor that summer at BYU. And so we knew between when I got off, finished EFY and when school started, I mean, it was, you know, you got to find a department. You got to, you got to call the temple and get a you're date. You're business. You're, you're made like, happen. We called, oh, yeah. we called yeah, the yeah. temple yeah. before we told our parents yeah. just to see what dates were open in August. Right. Yeah, yeah. So we got to make it happen quick. Yeah, it was so like, really quick. The yeah. actual the actual ceremony itself, mm-hmm. you would have gone through after they made the big changes. Oh, you you guys would have actually gone through the temple during the during the hardcore. Kind no, of, I just missed it by about no. No, it was 1990. Yeah, I went through in 91. Oh, yeah, I and missed I, it by I about went a 92. year. Yeah. Okay, so you missed that. I stuff. missed that stuff. So, yeah. any, anything you want to share about just getting married in the temple before we we're going to end this segment? I here. Well, I always want to talk about the temple and how much what a different outlook we had on temple um, because of our parents and mm-hmm. how we grew up. When I went to the temple, Salt Lake Temple, um, so it was a live session. It was, this was June of ninety two. I am I too loud or too quiet? Don't worry. Um, I loved it. I, when they did the initiatory, I felt like I was Esther or some of these women that were in the Bible that like thousands of years, women have been doing this and I'm getting the same blessing. And I loved it. I loved being in the temple. I loved, um, I was ready for symbolism. I was ready for all of those things that so many young people aren't. And so it was wonderful for me. I, I always love the temple until even now I love the temple. It was an individual thing for me. I had a terrible experience at the temple. 
my first time. <laughs> and I think it's because my parents had no idea how to prepare me for it. It was, again, practical. You get your garments, then you're ready to go on a mission kind of thing. And so I never took a temple prep class. I had zero idea of what happened in the temple. All I knew was I had this bag with new garments in it that I'd be wearing when I left. And in Oakland, where I was endowed, it's one of the few places where there's a stadium seating like a movie theater with no aisle up the middle. So I actually sat next to my mom. I sat next between my mom and dad in the endowment. And um, after the initiatory, my older brother and my dad were standing there and they said my eyes were like saucers. And I was so scared because all you wore was this sheet and you were naked underneath. And, and the sides were and open. And the sides were open. And I had never heard of that. Nobody told me about it. So when I'm in the dressing room and they're telling me to undress, I kept saying, you know, like my pants too? Yeah, take it off. My underwear? <laughs> yes. Well, what am I to wear? Oh, you wear this shield. So I put this thing on and I thought, they're, they can't be serious. It's like a Kleenex. <laughs> and, and this is sad, but you know, in my family, we joke and tease and all this stuff. And I honestly thought maybe my dad and my brother were pulling one on me. I really had that thought. And then when I walked out and they both said, you're all right. And then it was like, okay, take a breath. And then I went through it and I came out and I just, it's so unlike anything you do at sacrament meeting that you just have no concept of it. And this is something that's so hard for modern Mormons to understand when you, because they've changed the shield that you wear now where it's sewed up on the sides. Well, they don't even wear it. I think but, they put on garments first now. Okay. Well, yeah. back then you put on this, it's like a poncho. It's poncho. like this, almost like this silk poncho with a hole where it goes over your head. She comes down in front and in back, but the sides you're totally buck naked, right? Yeah. And then you're going through these, you know, the washings and anointings, the initiatory, and some old man's touching oil and then touching different parts of anointing your belly, anointing your loins. And he's like You're touching fine. you yeah. naked yeah. in weird places. And it, and they fixed that because thanks to the God makers and to enough anti Mormons that complained about how, uh, uncomfortable and kind of inappropriate it, it could be. Yeah. But, uh, but people don't understand now that for over a hundred years, that was the Mormon temple experience, not to mention, yeah. For me, I had to do the slit your throat signs right. with my hands. The mason. And the disembowel yeah. my, you know, just all those penalties where if you divulged any of the secrets from the temple, you you threatened being killed in very violent ways. Right. Uh, all that stuff. People, they've the church has changed. And so people don't understand <laughs> how weird and creepy and traumatic, traumatic. that can be for people. Yeah. yeah. So when, when are you going through with that? Usually it's right before you go on a mission or get married. No, like when are you? Oh, that you know, part. disemboweling yourself. What do you mean? Well, you divulge the secrets, didn't you? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's, he's yeah. wanting to know when you're going to carry out the when penalties. When am I going to die? Yeah. yeah. No, someone will do that to you. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you're just waiting. What you risk. Yeah. yeah. Thank um, you. No, I appreciate it. Yeah. No, but <laughs> yeah. So my temple experience was not the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the best part of my temple experience was walking out the door. And it was a beautiful night, and I looked across the San Francisco Bay, and I could see the lights at Candlestick Park in the fog, and I thought, all right, it's going to be okay, because <laughs> the Giants were playing. When the lights <laughs> That's go right. down in, in the, the city, city. <laughs> yeah. That's right. and the sun yeah. shines. 2010 World Series, Steve Perry bay. came to San Francisco and sang That's that with awesome. the crowd. It was beautiful. Yeah. Okay, so to, end this ep- so to end this segment, you guys got married. Yeah. And how did it feel we overall? L- Great. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Happily ever after. We lived happily. happily ever after. And we've had we, we hit twenty five years in about three months we'll hit our twenty five year anniversary. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well that ends part one of our epic interview with uh, Joanna and Scott Purvis and Maddie, Sophie, and Jake. Uh, sorry Lily couldn't be here, but We've kind of covered their upbringing up until the temple marriage. We are going to come right back for part two of this episode where we're going to talk about, uh, you know, their young family in the church, their ascent into uh, Mormon leadership culminating in Scott uh, being bishop. And then we're going to talk about how it all unravels and then how they reconstructed it. So thanks for joining us. Thanks to the Purvises. 
stay tuned for more Mormon stories uh, in the next episode. Don't go away. Come right back.